Welcome everyone. Excuse me. Welcome everyone. I have the opportunity of introducing a fantastic person, Dr. Ed Chen. Ed has a doctor of pharmacy from Ohio Northern University. He completed the nuclear pharmacy certification program from Ohio State University. And he has a master's of business administration from Western Governors University. He's now working as a nuclear pharmacist with Cardinal Health. Growing up with infantile nystagmus, he realizes the importance of learning to master mobility and technology and to obtain the latest healthcare clinical information. Now to complete his dream to improve his vision, he went to pharmacy school to learn how to read his medical charts to better communicate with the various healthcare providers. Ed joined Ann's board of directors in 2020 after attending his first Ann conference in Washington, DC in 2019. He spends his time serving on various local and national boards, singing with Harmony Project, practicing yoga, and traveling abroad to immerse himself in different cultures. He is truly an example of what you can accomplish while having nystagmus. I present to you, Dr. Ed Chin, Farm D. Thank you, Rouse. I appreciate that wonderful introduction. So I'm actually gonna go share my screen. So I'm gonna turn off my video so you can see my screen and share my PowerPoint with you. Give me one moment. All right, can everybody see the PowerPoint? Is it coming through? Okay, we can. Perfect. Um, so I just wanted just today wanted to kind of go over um, the pharmacological treatments for nystagmus, um, knowing that this is actually not a like a really common way of treating nystagmus. There's many many ways. This is actually probably one of the the fewer ways, but I think it does you know does deserve a talk to describe about it. So, I'm gonna so kind of in a general, like what um, Roz was telling, telling you guys about, for me, it was, it was this journey. I wanted to kind of understand, you know, the three aspects that were really important for me was the mobility, you know, understand mass transit. And for me, one of the things I looked at kind of was like, where is mass transit really popular or where is it easy to get to? So New York City is a great example where North and South is really easy to get to, but East and West, it's hard. So these are things I kind of just kind of looked at the frequency in Hong Kong, um, the mass transit, the buses run every four minutes. So just kind of like look at different things and how people were, you know, um, look at different societies. Technology was pretty much one of those things that when I saw my first computer, I just got excited. I mean, it was from the from the typewriter to the electronic typewriter. I mean, so I've kind of grown up on a, a bunch of stuff. So when I saw the first computer, that was pretty exciting for me. Just to think about how much stuff that you could do in the same amount of time. And so there was that aspect that I was always an early adopter. And then finally I had the opportunity and I said, you know what, I've got information, but I really don't have enough information to kind of go on, you know, to kind of understand my medical chart and stuff like that. So that's kind of when I went to pharmacy school. So I'll show you, this is kind of like my desk at work. Um, so you can see, like I use a lot of um, visual aids and stuff like that. Um, the bottom is where I put a prescription down there and I'm able to expand it to a comfortable level that I'm able to see. 
So in my role, I dispense like nuclear pharmacies for the radiology department. I don't deal with any of the, um, the general meds. Um, what's unique about my position is I work in a closed pharmacy, so there's no interaction with the public. So it's very, very little distraction for me. So that's pretty, um, pretty awesome. Do love that. Um, the orders come through either from phone calls, voicemail, fax, and web orders. Um, so the pace that I'm actually required to be able to keep up to maintain this job is I'm, a, I'm required to dispense four to 600 prescriptions in three hours. So if you think about it, that's a pretty fast pace. And then you think about what the error rate is, you know, like the Six Sigma level. So what you're looking at is at 3.4 errors per million. So that's kind of what their industry is judging by. So if you kind of look at like, you know, for me to have nystagmus and for me to kind of like to be up against these challenges, this is kind of where I really was like, you know, I need to go in and really understand, you know, the science behind it. Like just, you know, hearing something, reading something that just wasn't enough for me. So, all right. So now, I need, now you have a little bit of background about myself. Let's go and start. I think like really, I think we really need to talk a kind about the eye anatomy. So if you look at the eye anatomy, um, what you're going to see is like when you look at something, the light's going to come through. It's going to go through this. Um, cornea, it's going to go through from the cornea, it's going to go through this pupil, which is this opening right here. Then it's going to hit the lens. We're going to go through the aqueous humor. And then this is the retina on this side. This, this yellow is what you're going to be able to see. So that's because you're going to pick up the images and that's just going to send the signals to the eye. Um, so again, for some of you guys that want more detail, um, so here we go again. So we're going to go from the cornea to the pupil to the lens, and then it's going to it's going to go ahead and go to this retina, this area. So one of this area I want to want to point out to is this fovea. So fovea on this next point, we're going to talk about how it's different. Um, it's this is where a lot of the concentration of like the visual sight is. So there's there's two primary photoreceptors that we're talking about right here. We have the cones and we have the rods. So your cone is primarily for your color vision and your rods are for kind of like the shadow, kind of like the, the darkness. So I use the movie theater as a great example. So we come into a movie theater, it's dark. You kind of see where there's, there's a chair, but you kind of can't really tell what color the chair is. So that's kind of, that's where your rods and your cone is actually for your sharp vision. So this is, this is where, you know, when we're reading, when we're like looking and studying, especially with people with nystagmus, we're trying to focus in onto this point. This is where we get that clear vision. So let's kind of like talk about, you know, some general, you know, terms are like um, characteristics of nystagmus. So you've got the oscillating of the eyes, you've got the reduced vision, you've got this, um, this oscillopia, which is kind of like, it looks like the images are jumping, but they're really not jumping. And so because of all these things that are, you know, fighting against you, you've got this visual function that's actually lower than, um, that most people would have. And so where how they would distinguish it is basically knowing that your visual functions could be lower than what if you had another eye condition. So the prevalence is actually, um, it doesn't seem like a lot. Um, so the, one of the studies that I looked at, they were saying it's about maybe one per, at least 1%. This one actually said it's about um, 24 per 10,000, which is about 2.4%. So a lot of this is actually just not seen um, you know, unless people really know what they have or kind of, you know, what they're seeking. So I really think these numbers are actually like underreported. So let's talk about this nystagmus, this characteristic. So, so what makes the nystagmus, it has to have this rhythmic bipasic oscillation. So there's always this rhythm. So actually which, what is the patho, um, um, the patho part is, are the, pathophysiology part is actually this part is actually the smooth, the slow phase. When you have the slow phase, all of a sudden the eyes, you know, the, the this uh, brainstem thinks it needs to kind of re counteract. So then it creates this fast pace. This is what we call the nystagmus. This is what we call the, this, bi this um, biphasic oscillation. So it's the pathological phase. It's actually the slow phase is what's causing, and then the, the rebound or the reflex is causing this fast phase. 
Um, so, so basically you're seeing like characteristic is we're talking about that phobia, that fixation, um, it's interrupted. And you know, it's just that uh, the eye movements is actually probably the best way to record it. So again, we look at some of the symptoms. We talk about the involuntary eye movement. We talk about movement that can be in one or both eyes. You know, objects may be blurry, maybe shaky. Um, you might have time um, trouble seeing at night. So that's where we're talking about, you know, the, the rods and the cones. Um, and you have the balance and the dizziness. So I think one of the things that's really interesting with nystagmus, if you look at it kind of, you know, where we're talking about why is this, you know, this uh, retinal image slip. So normally when you look at something, you see how it's all in a line. But what happens when you have nystagmus, you have this eye movement, you know, you're trying to look at one object and it's kind of, sh it's shaken. And so that's, this is what, this is what the retinal slip is. So this is where, you know, you're not getting that sharp vision. So again, this is kind of what I was just talking about, you know, the slow, you know, in a physiological um, nystagmus, that's like just when you turn your head, when you ride a roller coaster, just like, you know, your normal thing, you're going to see the slow phase is going to be, is going to be minimized by this retinal image slip. But when you have a pathological nystagmus, which is most of what we're talking about um, at this conference, you're going to have the slow phase out that's going to cause this retinal image slip. And it's interesting that, you know, just to know that even a five degree per second is enough to create that decrease in visual acuity. All right, now, so we, now we've talked about, you know, some of the general basics about nystagmus, and we talked about kind of the, um, you know, some of the terminology. Let's also go ahead and kind of talk about the, the three types of nystagmus. So you have your infantile nystagmus. This is the one that's early onset. Um, in the past, it's been called congenital nystagmus. A lot of times it, it is idiopathic, just means there's no known origin. Um, they don't know what causes it. So that's what makes it kind of harder to treat because if we knew exactly what caused it, that would be um, beneficial. All right, so the second type is the spasmus newtens. Um, this one is primary due to, um, it's developed in like mostly in children. So it's between the ages of two and eight. A lot of times the children that have this nod and this tilt of their heads and the eye movements may move in any directions. Um, the nice thing about this one, this is good to phase out of this one. So there's just no treatment that's required on this one. Acquired nystagmus, this is the one that comes later on life. Um, this is actually due to like neurological diseases. This is caused that um, where the jumping, and we were talking about the jumping of it. And so it could be like, so with the patient's viewpoint or their quality of life is actually um, what's really common is the reason why we're, um, you know, treating, treating these nystagmus and we're looking into that because the quality of life, you know, like driving, the ability to drive, the ability to see a chalkboard, um, these are pretty critical and these are pretty, um, you know, life altering. So give me one moment.
Um, so it's interesting to, to notice um, when you think of, you know, when you look at clinical studies, what you really, really truly want is you want the gold standard. You want to have like the randomized controlled studies. You want them to be double blinded where the treatment and also the, you know, the patient and the investigator um, are not aware of what was given. Um, but a lot of times, especially when you're looking at, you know, smaller you know, populations or smaller case studies, you're going to see most of them, especially with nystagmus, they're going to be mostly case risk studies and, you know, kind of observations. And the reason for that is because in order for you to do, you know, like a gold standard of the double blinded um, case study, they're just tight, they're expensive, they're time consuming. Um, Uh, with, with the pendular nystagmus, those are when it's equal in velocity. There's really no like correction. You won't see that jerkiness. And the, the jerkiness in nystagmus, that's where the most more common ones, you're going to see that, that slow pathological phase followed by that fast corrective you know, phase in the opposite direction. So infantile nystagmus and spa, spasmus newtons are more likely in childhood. So let's go ahead and go through um, like the common types of nystagmus. Let's go start by downbeat. So the terminology of the um, the way nystagmus is um, described when you say downbeat, down is when you're having that that rapid movement. So it could be you know you know you could be like looking down or looking on the side that could cause that you know that that rapid that jerkiness of that movement and so some of the common ones that you're going to see is you're going to see with this one this is just an example these are just disease states that you would see downbeat nystagmus with this one um you see like the cere the cerebrum is actually pushing into this um brain stem so that's where this is an example we're going to see so also you're going to see like if this is the this area has some degeneration and even drug um, intoxication. This is where you're going to see this downbeat. It's very common. So with the downbeat treatment, uh, most of it's going to be, um, I guess, more, um, what's the word, uh, most best treated with this, this 4 amiota pyridine. Um, so it's between five to 10 milligrams, three times a day. So you're going to see the reduced in nystagmus. You're going to see the reduced in in visual um, vision. Um, so when they did the, the randomized control study, when they compared it, um, this, this 4AP actually had a greater decrease in nystagmus. So, so it's pretty much, there's, you know, there's, um, this is pretty much the, the preferred standard. So upbeat is the same thing. We're looking at, you know, the upbeat, you're talking about the jerkiness of the nystagmus is going up. So you're gonna see this on the increase on the up gaze, uh, but not, not normally on the lateral. And so certain, certain of these nystagmus, you're gonna be able to tell kind of where they come from or kind of where the area is that's affected. So if this one, the upbeat nystagmus, it's gonna affect more the, the, um, the cerebellum and the pons. So this is kind of where you're seeing the pons, cerebellum. And so this, the fourth ventricle, this fourth ventricle is just to kind of protect the brain from a trauma. And so mm -hmm. it's actually in this, the vermis right here is actually where this is, um, you know, people that have this upbeat nystagmus, this is usually the area that's um, commonly the, the cause of it. And so it's interesting, you know, like, so here, like, you know, I talked about, you know, vertices um, and and encephalopathy. Um, so this is a vitamin deficiency. So for example, if the person has a thiamine deficiency, they will show upbeat nystagmus. So a lot of times in this example, they would 
doctors will actually do an MRI to set you to see if there's a structural thing. You know, if it's not a structural thing, that's when they kind of look at different things. You know, is it a vitamin deficiency or do, do labs? So it's so this is a, a great example of that um, nystagmus may not be you know solely caused by structural issues. It could even be a vitamin issue. So if you look at upbeat nystagmus, um, this is the one. So there really there are very few reports. Um, neither one of these drugs work really well. So it's pretty much this this one that works the best, this calcium channel blocker. And so we're Stanford's that primary um, upbeat position and also um, release that that shakiness. So you got periodical. Periodical is the one that um, is one of the best more understand. It's also the one in infantile nystagmus, and it's the one that it's, you know, it has periodic means it's based on time. So maybe, you know, few, every few minutes you will, it'll alternate in different directions. So that's what you're going to see. All right. So with this one, there's certain drugs that don't work. And these are the drugs um, that are not um, responsive to it. Uh, for the most part, it's only um, a few drugs that have been um, effective. So that's when we're looking through the case studies. We see the menantidine, um, the 5 to 10 milligrams um, QID, and then we see the baclofen. Um, so baclofen is pretty much the drug of choice in for people that have this uh, periodic alternating nystagmus and show that it's been responding well. So um, let's look at the other types. So you got an acquired pendular nystagmus. So with this type of nystagmus, when you think of sinus or movement, you're thinking not like sinus, but you're actually thinking like sine and cosine in the mathematical term. So you're seeing this, you know, this occur in horizontal and vertical in a combination of this type of nystagmus. And so this is this is one that you're gonna see more common kind of in MS, you're gonna see with um, stroke patients. So, so with this one, um, they were they were um, doing a study between like gabapentin and menantidine, and they wanted to kind of see you know um, what was actually the the outcome. And so what they've noticed was the reducing nystagmus and the reducing the jerkiness and improved vision. So infantile nystagmus, um, we're going to look at um, one of the randomized case studies. So one of the case studies where they're trying to compare gabapentin, and they're also comparing menantidine, and wanted to see if there was a difference um, with the two groups. And so in this study, um, they actually concluded that uh, that um, patients that got either the gabapentin or the menantidine did improve a vision and eye movement in the idiopathic group. And then also the patients that, um, that had other eye conditions, so the gabapentin and the menantidine, they also saw reduced eye movements in the group. Um, what this study did not do, it did not actually, um, you know, have like a, um, here, let me go back, sorry. It did not have a, a specific, um, let me think. It, it didn't have a specific like like dose. It was, it, I mean, it was it was in a sense that they did, it wasn't the, like an ideal dose. And this is what we're kind of like looking back. There was no optimum dose. There was no like, you know, specific duration of therapy. And that's, and that's a lot of times that's because, um, you know, nystagmus is pretty, um, it's not quite clearly defined. So that's why when they first did that study, um, they, did, they weren't able to kind of put in those criteria, you know, to be able to do the study. And one of the things that they did not include was actually, you know, the subset, you know, which, which patients responded well with menantidine and which patients responded well with gabapentin. So these are things that, you know, as we learn more, we're able to kind of, you know, be more strict, restrictive when we design the studies. So other, other um, drugs that are used, um, these are not as used as, as common. So Botox is a good example. Again, you're gonna see this mostly in case studies. 
And it's mostly for short term, you're really injecting into the muscle, you're really um, trying to reduce nystagmus and to improve vision. So here you can see, you know, one of the side effects is this, this, um, this ptosis, this, this falling of the eyelids. So here's an example, just provide you an example. And also the diploid actually seeing like um, double vision. Um, so Azop, um, this was the one that this drug is, they did a crossover study. So just kind of just wanted to give you an idea of what a crossover study is. A crossover study means you have people that are going to get like both treatments. So, you know, you go from one arm to the other arm. So you're seeing this washout period in the middle. So Azop is the eye drop that's currently used for glaucoma, um, but it was um, used over as a crossover blind double mass control trial featuring Azop and the placebo. And there was um, five patients in the study that had infantile nystagmus. And um, four of them had significant improvement in, in um, four of them had significant vision improvement. And then one of them had one more line on the Logmar line chart. Um, a lot of a lot of people don't know what the Logmar line chart. So um, it's just the eye chart. That's that's the, the formal name of, but that's so essentially they're able to get one more line of this. So you're seeing this eye improvement in um, after using the drug. Um, so as a summary, just wanted to talk about, you know, just, you know, you can see like pharmacological treatments are really pretty much specific to nystagmus. There really needs to be more clinical trials to be established the evidence um, because a lot of them, when we look at clinical trials, we would like to see at least a hundred, you know, you know, patients participating. Some of these are really small. We're like, you know, talking like 10, 15, maybe even 60. So um, just to have more um, clinical trials that will really help us to create those guidelines and to be able to teach everybody um, how best to treat people with nystagmus. And also right now, and it's pretty much again, it's it's an un um, with this um, with the summary like with clinicians. A lot of times you just need specialists and you need experts to be able to implement treatments because they are the subject experts and they are the ones that are going to be you know driving these studies. So, um, so for me, so it's just want to close on a final thought. Um, just kind of you know talking about my journey, kind of. Uh, what I've gone through, you know, um, thinking, you know, I thought that, you know, maybe going to pharmacy school and getting, you know, learning more about the, you know, the health information that was helpful. Um, it was um, for me from an intellectual point, but I think what really helped me was actually when I went to my first NES, um, AND conference. So I actually didn't even go to my first AND conference until 2019. And I think knowing that I was not alone, I think that was the most powerful of, you know, day, you know, just to be able to be able to um, understand, you know, like the holistic aspect of what nystagmus is and, and the impact that it has for my life. So, so that's pretty much what I have for you guys today. Um, does anybody have any questions? So why don't we have Anthony and mute, or Antonio, sorry. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to make sure I heard something correctly. Earlier you were talking about the K plus channel and you called that a calcium channel. Did you mean potassium? I, I'm sorry, yes, yes, thank you. Thank okay, you. I was just making sure, I know sometimes symbols yeah. can be used differently. So I just wanna make sure that was correct. Yes, yes, that was potassium, yeah. I was, I was thinking the potassium, um, potassium sodium ADPAs. I'm sorry, I was thinking and read something different. I apologize for that. Thank you for correcting me. Hey, Ed, I've got a question for you. This is Juan Gonzalez. Just, just curious yeah. whether, you know, the, the purpose of this research is specifically to explore treatments for nystagmus or is kind of the, the treatment of nystagmus more of a side effect? Um, which, 
where so, you, so there are ver- there are various drugs that you mentioned right? yeah. I know that, that sometimes we observe these unusual side effects like oh oh my gosh that person started growing hair or oh my gosh this person started you know losing weight and so the purpose of, of the studies is sometimes for one purpose but then we observe these side effects and that's what informs us and so i'm just kind of curious a little bit about how this research is evolving you know whether it's actually focused on nystagmus or it's just kind of an ancillary benefit. Yeah, so pretty much um, the, the case studies that I read, they were pretty much focused on, they were selecting a specific pa- um, patient population, they wanted to learn more. And so that was kind of how um, they were trying to um, find a more clearly defined um, guideline for treatment, so. Oh. Trying to figure out how to, let me see. see. Sorry, I'm trying to figure out. I see you have your hand raised, Rosalind. Just, you'll need to unmute yourself. Uh, My question was, I know you went into this area because you were thinking about yourself and the effects of nystagmus. Have you had the opportunity of taking any of the any of the pharmaceuticals that you talked about? And if you have, what did you think about it? Yeah, so mine is more um, the, the periodic, there's um, the alternating nystagmus. Um, so I did first try the baclofen. The baclofen created for me was very sedating. It just didn't work for me um, because in my job, like I said, I have to be very fast on my feet, have to be very alert and stuff like that. I also did try the um, the menantidine. Um, that one really, really sedated me. So that, again, that was not, it didn't work well. I mean, it it slowed my nystagmus, but I mean, it didn't, it, I wasn't functional. And so what, what I've really been using right now is actually um, the Azop. So that's like a, the eye drop that I was talking about that last one. That's actually been pretty helpful. It gives me a lot more like the cones. I almost, you know, it's that sharper vision. I'm going to be able to get like the clearer colors and stuff like that. Um, I've been try, actually trying to do a lot of research and just kind of understand how exactly it works because there's not like a clear, um, you know, method it actually works, but um, I'm I'm thinking it kind of has you know the the effect on the, the rods and the cones and and I'm thinking that's probably where the most effect is. Um, but just in general, I mean, I use a lot more lighting. Um, anybody that has like low vision, um, there was a study that they said that we pretty much need about three times more lighting. So that's one of the things that that's a simple fix fix for me, you know. And so those are things that I've kind of tried to augment. Um, even though it's, you know, I'm only taking like one of the medications I've talked about. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I see Natalie out there, if I'm reading that name correctly, Natalie. Yes, I do have a question. I take propranolol and I don't think I saw propranolol on your list there. Uh, what do you know about it and is it commonly used in the United States for treatment or am I just an exception? Uh, Propranolol is one of those old drugs that it has a lot of use. I mean, it's, um, it's so, I mean, I'm, I'm not surprised that they would use that drug. Um, like I said, a lot of, lot of, the, lot of the patients, um, just par- parallel in general, um, a lot of them, they have, um, um, it's some of the, sometimes it's the, um, like the side effects, like one of the side effects, they could be up to like a rapid heartbeat or something like that. So those are things that you just have to watch for, but I mean, it's, it's common, um, based on what I read, I haven't, I haven't seen that, but like I said, not to say that that's not common. Um, what type of nystagmus do you have? Well, I, 
you know, I know you went over uh, in your presentation, but I didn't quite get it myself. Maybe it's a language problem, but uh, I okay. have horizontal, horizontal nystagmus. So I don't know what you called it in your presentation, how that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Goes. So horizontal is, yeah, horizontal is more like the, um, the periodic, the alternating, that's probably the one that it would fall under. So because the other the other one was more like vertical, the vertical would be the up and down, and then the other one would be the horizontal. Mm -hmm. Okay, I understand. But yeah, I can I can look in a little bit more information. I can get back with you on that. Um, I'd be happy to do that. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Hey, Ed, an, another quick question for you. I know that um, sure. in one of the other presentations, there was a discussion about some of the side effects of drugs, and, and you yourself mentioned uh, some of the side effects. And so I, I guess I'd be curious, uh, given your experience and expertise in pharmacology, how you'd recommend that, that people kind of explore those side effects and how parents in particular can help children verbalize the side effects that they're feeling and all that kind of stuff. Just talk about side effects if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, so a lot of the side effects, you know, we're talking about kind of the gabapentin, we're talking about, you know, the, um, the menantidine. Those are pretty sedating, but like I said, the nice thing about those, like after a titration period, which is kind of like a time period, your body gets used to it. So, but that's the thing. Um, so when I try to take take one of those drugs, I pretty much, I think I ended up taking four weeks of work off. I mean, that's essentially what it took, you know, just for me to even try it. So, um, and I know if for some people that's not, you know, a possibility, you know, to, you know, kind of just put your life on hold for four months. I mean, four weeks just to be, a, be able to see, you know, if a, you know, a drug a treatment does work for you. Um, but like I said, that's, that's pretty much um, what you're going to expect because a lot of the drugs that they're using to treat, it's going to, you know, it's going to affect the central nervous system. So that's where you're seeing that, and that sluggishness, you know, kind of that sedation. Um, that's, that's what, those are things that you're really looking for. Definitely don't want to hog the floor here, but I've got another question for you and just looking for raised hands. And in the chat, feel free to ask questions by chat also. Uh, I think one of the questions that folks sometimes ask, if I get on this medicine, is this a um, kind of a, a lifelong thing or is this something that um, kind of helps cure or permanently improve a condition? And so I, I take it for, a week, a month, a year, and then I stop. Hmm. Yeah, most most of these, they're pretty much, they're, I, I would kind of almost describe most chronic meds. I think of kind of like diabetes. I mean, it's one of the things that, you know, you take it in order to keep you um, functional. So I kind of use, I love to use the example like asthma, you know, so, you know, there's there's Olympic athletes that, you know, they take an inhaler, inhaler to control their asthma. So they're able to be functional. So as you, as most people get older, their nystagmus, it actually slowers, so slows down. So, so maybe like around the early ages, you might need it more. And so like, it just depends, like, you know, what's your activity level, you know, for me being in a very um, demanding work environment, I will probably be, you know, using the days up for a while, but, you know, but maybe when I retire, maybe we're kind of a, like a slower pace of life. I may not, you know, I may be kind of be able to walk away from it. So I think it really just depends on what your, you know, your day-to-day -day requirements are. And I think that's where going to see a, you know, getting that functional vision, that analysis from that low vision op optometrist, that's really going to be helpful because our, everyone's needs are so different.
Certainly, Ross. I was just wondering, Ed, does the dosage have to be increased over time? You may have answered that question, but if you take it for long periods of time, is there an increase in the dosage? Uh, for for the most part, no. I mean, it's pretty it's pretty much you know once you get to that, once you're able to um, you know to get it get your next segment to the point where it's manageable, and I, and and that's pretty much. I mean, that's kind of what you're looking for, because if the dosage is too high, you're gonna be sedated. You're not gonna be functional, so you don't want to you don't want to go really push up to that that higher tier, but you just want enough to make it manageable, and so manageable for different people is very different so um so that yeah that's I, I would say that's probably the best way to answer that um so that's why a lot of times they they do kind of like you know they try out they'll try on the lower doses and they'll say okay well did that work and they, if it didn't work you know a few weeks later try the higher dose and then you can you find that that sweet point thank you Looking for additional questions out there, questions in the chat or by raised hand. Hey, Ed, I know that uh, some folks that have nystagmus also have other underlying health conditions for which they may be taking medication. Uh, I know that in, in dealing with family members, you know, drug interactions are a, a big thing to watch out for. Is there, is there any advice that you have any specific knowledge about any of these medications that you spoke about you know, drug interactions to be sensitive to? Well, I didn't really focus in on the drug interactions, um, but there are some great um, you know, databases to, to look into that. I mean, I could definitely provide that information to folks. Um, and, and like I said, um, a, a lot of times, you know, as a pharmacist, you know, pharmacists are required to do to, you know, to look at, you know, your your medication list before they, you know, before they, you know, sign off and dispense some medication to you. So that that, now that stuff is already pretty much um, done. Um, doctors will review that. So um, there are so many databases. And like I said, things change all the time. So it's, it's best just to kind of, you know, look at that stuff. But I would definitely provide some links. So people can kind of look into that and I can definitely write up like a summary sheet or after that, you know, to, um, to talk about that. There's a question in the chat about beta blockers and whether they help. Do you have some thoughts on that? So beta blockers that we're talking about, I think um, Natalie was talking about propanolol. That is a beta blocker. Um, it's a non-selective non beta blocker, but so that there are some that they do use that. Um, that that was not one of them I looked into, but like again, I can definitely you know follow up on with Max on that. That's not an issue. Antonio, looks like you've got a question as well. Yeah, I was wondering if there's any been any studies on the effects of caffeine in nystagmus. I have. I have not seen that one. Um, I can let me look. I'm at just that. wondering that's, if that would affect that's, that's the an rate interesting or not. one. Yeah. That's an interesting one. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know. I, I will get back with you, Antonio, on that. Okay. questions out there, either by chat or by raised hand. Is 
So I don't think I see any other questions right now. Ed, do you want to take a couple of minutes to, to wrap us up and, and take us into our break? Yeah, so that is all I have for today for my presentation. But um, the next one, there's the team panels um, and also the adult panels. So those are coming up pretty soon. So if you do get a chance, um, definitely go and go to either one of those. Um, so you're going to be able to talk and ask questions from people of that age group that have nystagmus. So I think that'd be a great um, panel for uh, people that have nystagmus or even family members or, you know, friends. I think that's a great way to learn. So look forward to seeing things, you there. And one of the things that I will point out is that those will be run as, uh, I think, webinars so that it will be slightly different in that context. You will definitely need to ask questions through, uh, through the chat and definitely use the raised hand function because in that sort of structure where we work to keep the speakers focused on the screen, uh, it's absolutely necessary for the, the, the host to unmute you and to, to give you permission to speak. So please, because that's gonna be a highly interactive panel, just be aware of that. And just, if you haven't found it yet, make sure you find the, the raised hand function uh, in the chat so that we can, like we did here, just facilitate getting these questions asked and answered. Uh, look forward to seeing you guys over there. I think that's at the 15, is that right, Roz? Let me look at my schedule. Yes, at the 15, so that would be at 4.15 Eastern. Uh, 115 Pacific, 315 Central, 215 in the mountains. And thank you very much. You know, thank you, Dr. Chan. Thank you.